We need, oh, well, what we used to have intro music. It was like real folksy and stuff. What happened to that? You know, I've come to the belief that you just go right into it. Nobody <laughs> wants any bullshit anymore. Okay. Oh. They just want, they want the juice. But they don't want the squeeze. This whole about bullshit, Harry. What are you talking about? <laughs> Shame on you, Jennifer. No. In fact, why don't we introduce Eric? Eric, I want to be the first to welcome you to BeerNet Radio. This is the podcast where all your dreams come true. And with that high expectation set. Yeah, today we have BeerNet Radio. We have uh, Eric Schulman, co-founder at Serene Craft Beer Distributors. Uh, New York-based Serene has been making moves most recently having entered Ohio, which is what we'd love to talk about today. But you guys also operate in New York, New Jersey, Connecticut, Pennsylvania, and again, of course, now Ohio. So welcome, Eric. How are you today? Good, good. Thank you for having me. Honored to be here. I was looking forward to being part of the pre-show banter, but I guess we're <laughs> after it now, so let's do it. I don't, yeah, I don't know what Harry's on today. They must have started him on a new course of meds or something. <laughs> Just kidding. But uh, yeah, no, I want to get on the Ohio deal because that was really interesting. But uh, let's start with the big question. So what's the role of a distributor like Serene these days, right? Oh, okay. Uh, that is the big <laughs> one to start with. Yeah, I mean, I would say, you know, I... Distributors like us, I guess we're talk talking like craft distributors who, right. you know, independent who have opened in the last 5, 10, 15 years, something like that. I think that space is probably more important than it has ever been. I'd say that, you know, I, attention to brands and product care has always been top of mind for all of us, which is, you know, obviously important. But I think maybe at the root of the question is, you know, I, if the industry is going through like a period of streamlining with corporate buying and corporate chains and, you know, a bit of consolidation. I, you know, I think uh, it, it does raise a difficult question. I know that uh, larger wholesalers are also doing some of that streamlining or consolidating. Mm -hmm. I've seen some larger wholesalers in our, in the States we operate in have, you know, increased delivery minimums or yeah. Yeah. decreased their delivery days. Uh, some have eliminated craft divisions, uh, which usually, uh, started around the time that we started to kind of combat some of this. So a lot of these things are probably unfortunate developments for craft, but in a lot of ways, uh, you know, it is, it does make what we do important and it does make it a little easier for us. I think we've always kind of been comfortable zigging into a space where a lot of people are zagging. Uh, that right. makes sense. I think we're going to get back to three distributor markets. Two high share distributors are not enough because you know, like you, I think like you're implying is that people fall through the cracks and it's not even worth to these big distributors, some of these smaller brands. Yeah. I mean, we're definitely already seeing some of that lay bare and I think you're probably hitting the nail on the head that, you know, uh, at its core, that three, three distributor model is where this is all headed, uh, give or take one or two in every market. Right. I wanted to ask, just jumping on that real quick. With that said, Eric, do you see more craft distributors popping up or do you see established craft distributors like yourselves getting bigger or both? Yeah, I mean, it's hard to uh, prognosticate, especially in something being recorded where uh, my prognostication <laughs> does not get to disappear into the ether. Uh, nobody's listening. Yeah, nobody's. <laughs> we'll turn the button off there. It's off. <laughs> I boned up before this. I got to listen to a couple of <laughs> But yeah, I mean, I'm sure new people will pop up maybe as extensions of like new segments that are popping up or will pop up in the future. I do also, though, see consolidation uh, as a thing that might be here to stay. And I don't know how often this has been covered by you guys on the podcast or the publication or what have you, but it's definitely something we're seeing a lot of, uh, you know, uh, bigger players are merging with one another. And so I, I think... Uh, as a way to skirt the question altogether, I will say that, uh, yes, uh, there will be uh, fewer and more simultaneously. Uh, there will be consolidation and probably some new ones popping up at some point, too. Yeah. Got it. Well, so how about, you know, you entered a new market in Ohio, right? So you guys are in, what, five markets now? That's correct. So what's the strategy there? Like, why Ohio? Why expand? How do you make that profitable and effective? Sure. I, yeah, I mean, Ohio for us was kind of a natural extension of where we were already. Uh, three years ago, we launched Pittsburgh and just Western Pennsylvania oh. in general. So I'd call that our first foray outside the Northeast. And so it was, uh, 
uh, you know, it is right next door. I think it is a place where uh, there is some product education for Serene's products that need to be done. You know, we come from New York, New Jersey, Connecticut originally, which are, I think last I checked, I think it was like the 47th, 48th and 49th states in beer consumption per capita. We are only ahead of Utah out here. So getting back to our family roots in the Midwest where people are good old beer drinking folk uh, is where we're most comfortable. Uh, It is a heavily populated state. There are a lot of major metro markets. Their beer education is great. And it's also COD, which is good. uh, If that answers Mm -hmm. part of that. It's a huge deal. I mean, I don't think a lot of people recognize that the difference between operating in a cash state where you just have no accounts receivable, basically. It's yeah. Beautiful. I mean, it, it, it lowers, you know, overhead significantly. I mean, forgetting just the tracking down of monies owed and whatever else. I mean, it's just also a massive figure uh, that you have to swallow. And we've always been self-funded. Uh, yeah. I mean, you gotta, you have to have a good banker if you're going to carry your customers. <laughs> sure. Uh, and convince them that it's actually coming our way. Right. Uh, but yeah, I mean, and Jen, I think you asked something about, I, I guess, scaling towards the end of the question or staying efficient or effective. And right. we're doing something that like the bigger guys have done always. Right. I mean, they, this is taking like taken mostly directly out of the playbook of liquor and beer wholesalers who have been multi-state for decades. And there is like definitely benefits to scale, even if it is in a market next door to one we're already servicing, you know, we have technologies and centralized roles in place that make, you know, turning these things on relatively straightforward and can be pretty cost effective for us. So it's not anything super new or anything that you guys haven't already seen or not saying anything you or your listeners don't know already. Right. I think this is, is that like centralized tell cell or and centralized online ordering and that and routing and that sort of thing. Yeah. So, so routing, yes. All the backend stuff. We have not super dipped into the online ordering thing yet. I have fundamental, like, I think there's just a fundamental question that needs to be answered. How do you effectively sell on top of the order that somebody's inclined to place or educate a customer without, you know, without being in there and doing the hand-to-hand combat rather than just taking an order that comes in over the transit, you know, via email. And uh, yeah, I, I mean, think cause that that's your kind of calling card is the hand selling part. So yeah. sure. Yeah. And I mean, again, you know, I alluded at the top of this call that just, you know, some of the bigger guys have eliminated positions. And I think, you know, we all came up in sales, my partners and I, and so we, you know, super value that. Uh, and I think it's going to become additionally important. I think it's kind of a unique industry in that way still. I think it's one of the more handshake driven, you know, uh, I mean, actually, totally. in course, you know, a place where conversations happen. It, you know, it totally before. is. I thought about that all weekend. I was thinking a lot about AB and one of the big criticisms out of Carlos's report, not to get too off the subject, was that their lack of experience being out in the trade. And I think like if you're selling Fritos or any other consumer good, it is not nearly as important to have those handshake deals. You know, in our industry, we deal with a lot of drunks. And so you kind of have to think like a drunk, even if you're not one. So, I mean, it kind of benefits you to kind of be one, but if you're not one, at least kind of get in their head and I think that's what, you know, the Ivy Leaguers don't get up in, uh, at Harvard. So that's, that's my That's the input. title of Harry's next book, Think Like a Drunk. <laughs> think Like a Drunk. <laughs> I mean, it sells itself. If you don't write it, I will, Harry. Well, I mean, why do you think this publication has been so successful? <laughs> Fashioning success. But uh, you know what? You also mentioned uh, players getting together. And so we did this. I don't know if you were referencing like Scout in Columbia, but you know, there's like a JV there. Have when you enter new markets, have you considered JVs? Yeah. I mean, so we I was more referencing before just the consolidation that's happening in general. We'll call it above us, right? Yeah. You know, and, and Harry is mentioning it too, is like the three, three distribution houses in any given right. market that you're talking about, only two macro players. Uh, there already has been some like New York, there was Manhattan buying phoenix beehive like years ago yeah. now at this point uh, uh, some pretty huge vessels <laughs> merging here uh uh but uh but yeah there you know we've been talking about this internally a lot there are a lot of people like us out there in, in some way shape or form we're talking independent wholesalers started at some point in the last you know 15 20 years whatever it is and we don't have like a formal 
group or yeah. trade group or yeah. anything like that. And so it's been, we have been really trying to make those relationships out of market, uh, independent of looking to enter those markets, just talking with people and, you know, and seeing what's been working for them. And I think it'll be a super helpful exercise for us to continue to talk to folks like us. I, but yeah, I mean, I, we aren't necessarily looking for JVs when entering a new market, but we'll definitely always keep it on the table wherever it makes sense. Uh, in Ohio, we purchased uh, Adina, who's you know smaller wholesaler based in Cincinnati, and that was not the intent. We were going to Ohio independent of that. Right. It just came about after the fact. How many wholesalers of your size are there? Like, do you think? <clears throat> Uh, so we'll do about a million cases this year. Yeah. Europe and Scout before last I checked, I think there were close to 2 million. Yeah. There are, uh, you know, I think again, of the, a lot of the people who started, you know, in the last 10, 15, 20 years, there aren't many who have gotten to our size. Mm-hmm. Certainly we are well past where I thought we'd be years ago. <laughs> uh, so I, yeah, I don't, we are a pretty unique thing, I think, as far as size and scope and age. Uh, but there are a ton of like-minded people out there who also do, you know, a similar thing or provide a similar service for sure. And it I, does seem like you guys, I'm sorry, Jen, I'm, I, I, old man has to say it before he forgets, <laughs> but it, you, I mean, you do, um, yeah. Not, not great memories. <laughs> but yeah, the, you know, the smaller kind of craft hand selling distributor does have a unique set of challenges that it would, I would think, benefit for you guys to get together once a year or something to kind of benchmark. I think you see these distributors in kind of the same markets is because is it, and correct me if I'm wrong, but isn't it hard to go into a state like Florida where there's just dominated by chains? Uh, is it you know easier to sell when it's more fragmented like up in the Northeast mm-hmm. in Ohio? Yeah, sure. There, When we're making decisions going to new markets, I touched on a little bit, but in more detail, you're totally correct. It's not just whether or not it's COD or, or you know, we definitely evaluate all of that. And all of our markets are fairly different and have a number of different laws governing them that are either beneficial or not so much to us. I mean, we have uh, New York City is this massive market, but it's also a massive, you know, bodega convenience market for those who have been, you know, you know, you can stop in any deli or bodega and there are a couple doors of space and that's great, but also a little bit challenging for us and uh, getting to all of them, right? Uh, and then, yeah, at places that are absolutely dominated by chains also, you know, provide, you know, is a huge roadblock for us or anybody starting up or, you know, anybody who isn't enormous already, I guess. Uh, so, so those factors go into these decisions for sure. Okay. How do you compete with like a Sheehan, right? Because they're active in a lot of your markets. They sell a lot of the high-end stuff too. So how do you do that? They're one of the people who's, you know, who are consolidating too, right? I think they've shed a couple of their New England markets yeah. recently. I, if this counts as a disclosure for the podcast, <laughs> I used to work there. Um, there you go. Uh, well, <laughs> yeah, if, you know, nothing but good feelings about my time there. I, uh, but yeah, I don't, the goalposts for us, I don't really I don't have anybody in our crosshairs. Like we need to be this way or this size, I, we've really been hyper-focused on what's going on in our four walls rather than thinking too much about the moves around us. Uh, and, uh, you know, uh, we've been able to leverage technology and staying lean in certain areas and nimble and, and stuff like that. So, you know, I don't see, I know we occupy the same space, but I don't look at anybody as like a, this like competitor where there's this finite high, right? And everybody's eating into it. I think, you know, uh, the idea is to find ideas that bring value and increase the size of that pie uh, in general. Uh, uh, were you able to pull anything out of that word salad there? Does that... Uh, that- no, I mean, l- listen, yes. you could live off the lost sales of Bud Light for years and you'd be sure. fine. Right. So sure. you don't need to compete with uh, with Knife. Although, you know, I guess they are an AB distributor. But they are an AB distributor in, in some markets. Least, yes. Yeah. Uh, pretty major markets. Yeah. I will not be providing a Bud Light pull quote today. <laughs> oh, don't worry. I've, don't I've said you. enough. Well, let's talk a little bit about craft. You were mentioning convenience and, you know, we've seen craft, albeit larger craft, make some inroads into that channel. But do you see that channel being an opportunity for more of the mid to smaller players in the segment, or is that just kind of for the big craft? Yeah, players? I mean, you know, we've 
been making those inroads. We've, you know, I think we've kind of always punched above our weight class in several of our markets in the chain department, but it's the focus at all ABPs with our suppliers at the end of the year. It's, you know, what's going on with chains? How can we leverage, you know? And so everybody's vying for that space. You know, I do think some of the consolidation again that I've talked about is helpful. It's fewer dock times for those chain grocers and stuff like that. So it is a matter of partnering with the right brands and making sure that, you know, you have some sort of offering worth it to them. But I don't think, you know, I think the more influence chains have, which I think, you know, you had alluded to prior to this question, even the more influence or, or Harry did uh, and sway that chains have in a particular market, the worse I would say overall it is for craft, whoever that may be, or smaller brewers, you know, whoever those may be. Uh, it certainly is challenging, but, uh, but for us, I mean, we're, you know, uh, the industry is definitely going through some sort of reckoning. Maybe that's a strong word, but, you know, we're up double digit percent across our network and we're, you know, sort of an amalgam of a lot of, you know, mid, uh, smaller, mid-sized brewers. And so I'm definitely aware of some of the things that are happening in the market and some of the scares that have been happening for some people. But so far, uh, we are fortunate enough to not be living in that space just yet. Yeah. Sea stores are such a double-edged sword because you want to be in them, but do you? Because if you're only dropping off two cases a week, it ain't a profitable deal, you know? Yeah. And some of our suppliers don't necessarily know the answer to that question for themselves either. I, yeah. you know, a lot of people who are super concerned about product quality on the shelf and care and justifiably so, while also, you know, wanting to make sure they're uh, meeting the moment and that maybe a little bit of a changing of the scene with, you know, with chain influence and or C stores or whatever. And so it's definitely a tough question that needs answering. But, uh, you know, our, we try to train our salespeople anyway, that, you know, uh, sacrifice the sale today for the sale tomorrow in general. Uh, so uh, don't push anything that's not going to work because, you know, you might not get a shot with that retailer again. Uh, and so it's sort of, sort of been our mantra with this all along. All right. And are y'all looking at taking on more beyond beer brands or are your craft partners kind of already doing that for you? Yeah, I mean, I definitely, yes. I mean, non-alc has grown for us if like just non-beer or non-alc, both have grown for us considerably this year. A lot of our brewers are dipping their toes into that market. I I will make one prediction and say, you know, it, it does look like, and we've been talking about this internally, that it looks like breweries might pivot a little bit to becoming rounded beverage companies instead. I'm not sure how much this has been covered by you guys or whatnot, but it, it seems to be the trend that they're open to it. Uh, and if they, you know, our supplier partners are, there's no reason we can't grow with them in that space too. Just anything and, and everything like. Yeah. I mean, it, all the while, while craft has been uh, growing sort of unabated for I don't know what wave is this that started. 15, 20, I don't know. Yeah, like we've had this sort of growth for a long time, and uh, all the while there have been these kind of offshoots that that are some are flashes in the pan. Uh, let's say like root beer uh, ten yep. years ago, or you know, and some have some real staying power, and the amount breweries are scared of them or willing to participate in them uh, has varied over time. But I think uh, we definitely have a lot of brewers who are entering non-beer or non-traditional beer spaces a little bit more. And I think that'll probably continue. What is the most it, common segment they're moving into? Is it non-alc or spirits or THC? Yeah, uh, right now uh, it's non-alc. I think three years ago, everybody rushed to make a seltzer and largely they ended up being mostly successful in the tap room where somebody is there and they can have an exclusive, their own seltzer line uh, there. Uh, Non-alc beer has definitely been a big growth category for us and something that our brewers are willing to try. Uh, industrial arts safety glasses for me has been a lifesaver. It is the best uh, I know. Yeah. Uh, so, but uh, yeah, get it's definitely some. Yes, uh, <laughs> definitely some. Uh, yeah, we can talk after the call. You said get us right? some. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I, so, so non-alc beer, but I, we've had inquiries into THC, you know, CBD has been a thing. I foresee that stuff happening a lot, but I, none of our breweries have made any THC products to date, or maybe only one or two, uh, but maybe that number will pick up for sure. It does seem like the, that craft brewers are increasingly, you know, saying, setting aside that we're a pure 
full barley, you know, you know, it, I'll give you this, like a uh, David Walker at Firestone gave a speech. I think it was at Brewbound where he said, you know, we got to get back to our roots, just stick to beer. Don't do this. And he kind of got a lot of backlash about it. Sure. I mean, just in the, in, you can see in comments and trade press and stuff like that. So yeah, I definitely think that the, it's turned over that, that we're not going to just for the sake of calling yourself a brewer, uh, you know, a craft beer brewer that, Hey, we got to make money here and we got to follow the consumer. Sure. I don't necessarily disagree with like the ethos of that though. I would say that, you know, I think some mistakes were made along the way by the industry at large. I think, you know, I, uh, I, there was the skew Mageddon, uh, which I know was the big buzzword for a while, uh, which made it impossible for retailers to, you know, across the board to adequately make sure that stuff was in code. So I think, you know, some end consumers have had some problems, you know, with buying a four pack that of a certain price point and getting burned by the quality of it or whatever. And so that's something the industry definitely has to deal with. But at its core, you know, I love the idea of experimentation and exploring curiosity, but also, you know, I, making solid beer and being responsible for it while it's out there, uh, you know, is, is something I can definitely get behind if that's sort of, you know, more in line with what he had intended to say. Right. And, you know, it's expensive to take responsibility for your beer throughout this until it gets consumed till it's urine, but <laughs> I mean, basically, uh, but yeah, I mean, it's, I, you know, how many I, hazy IPAs, I'll, you know, I think also is everybody kind of rushing to the hot thing and then it's just over skewed and over branded. And I think right. getting a div diversity of styles is only going to help. And I think maybe we're going back to that. And I also, I'm alone in this amongst kind of analysts who think that, you know, uh, bourbon and spirits are just going to continue forever. I think beer is going to make a comeback as a category with the tip of the spear being craft beer even though you know the calorie thing i get all the taste profile doesn't fit but pete this thing does come in waves and beer is healthier at least it's perceived as healthier and it is natural and i think and it's handmade and it's a living growing you know all those things are gonna at some point when G's, gen z gets uh uh aged out of this bitch gen xyz whoever's after that may come back to beer uh, that's Harry's that's so my in big 30 prediction. years is that a I mean, 30 I'll, year prediction I'll be in the ground but you guys will be enjoying this re renaissance I'm sure yeah. Yeah, what are they calling that next one is it like isn't it like beta like they it's like starting over because of <laughs> it I mean if there is a generation I mean it's sorry, yeah, exactly. I need to bring it down but <laughs> it's gen tbd okay <laughs> it is. Nice. Thank well, you. we don't want to commit on anything because the world's going to <laughs> shit so exactly um I have a couple more for you of course so we've talked about it a little bit but directly what do you guys look for in potential partners and can you share some of your largest suppliers Sure. Yeah. Uh, Industrial Arts, I mentioned already. Lawson's, who I think has been here before. Uh, mm -hmm. Other half, KCBC, Single Cut, okay. uh, Weldworks, Dancing Gnome, cool. Shilling. Uh, there's okay. the list goes on. I don't want it. I'm afraid I'm going to leave anybody out. Anybody yeah. uh, You're sorry. at the Oscars um, and you've left out <laughs> your mom, your, your uh, producer, and your mother. And my kids and my mom, yes, yeah. <laughs> who are really at the core of this business. So, I, yeah, differentiation has been huge for us, right? Somebody who has a unique offering, and we've, again, talked about a couple times today, has been, you know, making sure that there is some, like, responsibility in, in marketing and price point. I think brewers are being asked to, or suppliers in general, I guess, are being asked to execute in phases of the game that they ne haven't necessarily in the past, right? I think before it was like make good beer and that was the overwhelming like thing to do. And that is what we looked for. And now it's like, do that. But also you have yeah. to do these 12 things uh, if you want to be successful in this space. So I, yeah, I mean, I, differentiation and executing in all phases of the game. Yeah, yeah. Can you edit that in post to make it sound better? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Try that up for me. No, it, the AI will fix it for us. <laughs> He's not the even robots. joking. He's not joking. <laughs> right. Yeah, you, the, may, the editing may be janky. That's not us. <laughs> That's just the robot. Yeah. But, um, I just sent my hologram in this whole time. It hasn't even been. I like know. That. Where are you right now? <laughs> I'm in my home office, which is also my bedroom. Uh, oh, okay. <laughs> okay. Can, can I ask, well, how did you get into this? What's your history? 
long story short, I can make it a little longer, just real quick. There is a (laughs) fun anecdote. uh, My brother and cousin uh, are my partners here, and our great-grandfather was a... uh, was a moonshiner in Wisconsin during during Prohibition. And there are all these stories about the tax man coming and trying to find the booze and like the entire town on Sundays uh, after church coming in because they knew that's where the bottles were. But uh, <laughs> more seriously and more recent uh, than 100 years ago is uh, I, one of us uh, started working at a liquor distributor and like 15 years ago, and that just snowballed into us working, all three of us worked at Sheehan. I mean, there's another partner too, my brother's brother-in-law, but the three of us worked at Sheehan and uh, yeah, we kind of noticed there there is a need for what it is we offer. And that's kind of been sort of like the prevailing ethos for us going forward has been, you know, can we bring value to a space? And that's going back to how we evaluate market decisions and all that. Uh, it's, it's, do people need us? <laughs> is, is there something we can provide that isn't being provided right now? And sometimes the answer is yes. In, in managing your portfolio, you kind of, I think, answered this, but I mean, do you look for gaps? Like when you're bringing on a supplier, what filling your portfolio gaps, I'm sure is important, but what other attributes are you looking for in a good supplier? Yeah, portfolio balance is definitely huge. And that can come in a number of different ways. It doesn't just have to be style or whatever. It could be price point and all that. Uh, But yeah, I guess to rephrase maybe a little bit of the way this was answered earlier, I mean, polish uh, is also something, you know, I think I... I love and loved the days of slapping a sticker on a 16 ounce can and, you know, sending it to wherever I, and that's great. And I still have nothing wrong, you know, nothing against that whatsoever. Uh, But we'll say that, you know, as we're looking towards this, I think, you know, uh, someone who, you know, uh, appears to present, you know, a product that knows what it wants to be and know, you know, knows what they're doing and is able to scale to, uh, it doesn't, you know, There is a bit of a revolving door to this if you're constantly taking on like smaller suppliers, I guess, that end up just replacing other smaller suppliers uh, as like the new taste of the day. And so so finding somebody who has aspirations and ability to scale and and the polish to do so is definitely something we're looking for. Yeah, I guess they can pay their bills. I mean, that all, that sure. all kind of flows into the same <laughs> funnel, I guess, yeah. you know. But it's usually us paying them, so. <laughs> yeah, that's true. That's true. Yeah. But uh, uh, all right. Well, anything else? Jordan, I can yeah, see your. I had one last one. Being, you know, craft focused, I wanted to ask, is your draft to package mix back to where it was pre-pandemic? Yeah, more or less. I mean, so much has changed with us internally, too, that it's the tougher to exactly figure out if we're a good representation of the entire market or not. But it mostly has some of our habits have not changed as a people. I think if we want to tread back into the waters of uh, society crumbling, we can talk about people preferring <laughs> to stay indoors and drink by themselves. Yeah. <laughs> but I, yeah, I mean, it it mostly has. Uh, I, I would not, you know, at a million cases for us, it's, it is still a small slice of the pie. So I don't know if we're necessarily representative of everything. Got it. Well, one last for me. Do you guys worry about or have the problem of, you know, you talked about not wanting super small suppliers, but on the flip side, as your suppliers get larger and larger, them mm-hmm. leaving you for somebody bigger and like more chain oriented? Yeah, uh, sure. It's a concern. Uh, you know, we have been really lucky uh, thus far. We have dealt with a couple of exits, uh, none of which have really ever been combative or contentious. I yeah, that's never really been our thing. Uh, if somebody does want to find a place to go and they found a place, I'm happy for them and we'll work on the terms of their exit. Like I'm not looking to hang on to anybody that doesn't want to be here. Uh, thankfully, we've maintained some pretty good, you know, uh, pretty good supplier relationships thus far. We always talk about, you know, uh, when courting suppliers or talking to our current suppliers or whatever, that just, you know, distributors aren't necessarily the choice of who is the the very best who is the shining city on the hill. It's more like who doesn't do the horrible things or who is the best of sometimes a not great batch. Uh, and so, who sucks uh, the least. Right. Who sucks the least is exactly how it's phrased. Yes. <laughs> Cause you yep. can't be everything to everybody. Nope. I mean, the, when I worked for a distributorship for like seven years, way a long time ago, but even back then shuffling suppliers was the hardest job. And we only had like, I don't know, 20 suppliers and we're a big distributorship, but I mean, 
just planning which shirts you're going to wear that day so that you don't offend anybody <laughs> and, and you know and just uh it is tapping you know no wonder i'm glad you don't have an over uh, exposure to draft just hunting down tap handles that never get returned and dealing with pallets and cooperage is just a pain in the ass people don't understand how hard it is to be a beer distributor everybody thinks that beer distributors are just rich and fly around on private planes and you know some of them do but it's still <laughs> a hard do, job i should have <laughs> mentioned that this is the bedroom in the back of my private plane yes i yeah, can tell in the back. That's it. yeah Yes. Uh, yeah, no, I mean, I, dis distributors in general are uh, sort of a dubious proposition, independent of beverage uh, distribution. It is a tough game. Uh, and cooperage and, and handles are definitely things that accounts receivable, you know, stuff that you guys have mentioned, uh, I, you know, are definitely all industry specific challenges, but, you know, challenges to distribution in general about scale or somebody leaving you or what have you. Thankfully, we've been very fortunate thus far and things like, you know, we've never had a down year uh, again, you know, our 10th year or whatever this is up double digit percent. So it's been going well thus far. Uh, yeah. I, and I know, you know, I had, I did have a screener question here that I'm going to open up for you guys. I uh, love that. I, yeah. Uh, you yeah, just opinions on where this is all headed. It's one of the things, you know, uh, you talked about, but you know, I, I don't really know people come into the office and swear that, you know, there was one year that brute was supposed to be the next thing. Uh, and at least on the East coast, it didn't really happen. Uh, but, uh, and I don't really have a great answer for it, but I did, you know, I, I am optimistic that people will stay curious in general. If we're talking about Gen Z or Gen TBD or whatever it is, uh, mm -hmm. that drinkers will remain curious. And I think if we can maintain that curiosity, you know, in a changing landscape, we've kind of always been comfortable in a shifting landscape. And if we can remain excitable and exciting drinkers, I think, uh, yeah, things will be good for us. But I also want to ask you guys, you guys have industry figures here all the time. I, and have like a ton of access I don't have kind of where you guys think things are headed. I don't know if this is breaching any journalistic protocol that if oh. coaxing you into an op-ed now, but uh, yeah, like I, where some of the common refrains you're hearing or what, you know, where you guys think this is headed. Beast unleashed. Beast unleashed. <laughs> I think brute. Let's go back to brute. It could be a big thing. It has everything that the consumer thinks that they want so i don't understand why it hadn't taken off but i'd love to see brew. it's better than sour beer it's too hard to make these sours we're getting infected beer all over the place <laughs> it's supposed yeah, to taste I, that way i it's also i mean it might be a tough question to answer just i'm around industry people all the time too and like i know for me i had one year where i was i swore up and down that half slash wit was yeah. the next thing because it was for me personally and i have unlimited access to beer and I, yeah, I pretty yeah. information I was giving myself and sending out into the world. But uh, <laughs> yeah, so you say brute. What about the rest of you? I think, uh, I think things are looking good for craft because I, for, you know, a two, three year stretch, it was all about better for you. Mm -hmm. And uh, seltzer kind of, you know, pushed that, but now it's turning back to flavor and people aren't as concerned, I think about calories and sugars and, I mean, look at Twisted Tea. And so I think people just want something that tastes good and that fits for craft. And uh, so I think the fuller flavor, higher ABV, and it'll just be, I do worry about the things caught in the middle, uh, four or 5%. I think that's kind of a premium light owned, import owned, and craft seems to do well, either non-alc or super high. Yeah, it's fair. So you're going with <laughs> hazy IPAs. Oh, he's going with richer flavor. It's going along with yeah, like but thing. If people like just stay curious about this whole thing, you know, they'll remember that like certain flavors are great and that's what it's really about. Also, better for you is gonna have a moment. Everything kind of has a moment in this space. It's cyclical or whatever we've called it a pendulum, whatever the metaphor is. Yeah, I think yeah. And you do have some brewers like New Belgium combining the two of them with you know a fruit force ipa and i think there's a whole lot of other people that can do that i don't know if they'll have the uh the muscle behind it like voodoo ranger does but you know it's a it's an opportunity for craft sure and this whole thing was right uh, is has been repackaging and reimagining of styles that existed so long ago you know i mean the ipa thing and the american ipa coming from that and then the hazier northeast coming from that is 
is kind of a cool thing and probably, you know, it speaks to the staying power and adaptability of the beverage, I would imagine. But uh, what about you, Jen? Um, well, I'll do the easy one first. I think Mexican imports, specifically constellations <laughs> of Mexican imports are going to continue to grow. They have a lot of tailwinds, right? I mean, demographics, premium, all that good stuff. Good marketing. Yeah. Talking yeah. about Voodoo Ranger, I mean, you can attribute the growth there to marketing as much as you can anything else, I think. I think some sort of IPA will continue to grow. I mean, people just love it. I don't think that's going away anytime soon. I do, I'll be a little devil's advocate on Jordan. I think the four or 5% stuff is going to grow a ton because of the whole sessionability, right? Like beer is what the third most popular beverage in the world behind water and tea. And it was, it basically was water back in the day. Right. And that's what that 4% is, you know, and that's, it's almost like not drinking. <laughs> I think people are going to start to use that more functionally. Personally, I don't understand why more of these like craft loggers haven't taken off more, but they haven't, right? I mean, they're starting to a little bit, but you would think, yes, they're way more expensive than, you know, BMC, but they're, I mean, from my opinion, they also taste a lot. They have more flavor, right? And obviously, you know, but so I don't know there, I do think non-alk is going to continue to grow for all of those functional as well. Yeah, we get a ton of reports from our supplier partners that whatever lager they make and serve in-house in the tap room does massive mm-hmm. volume and not saying anything you guys don't know already, but you know, people uh, do drink a lot of lager and when confronted yeah. with that is there only, you know, a uh, option to see yeah. other flavors or styles. Uh, so I think to win that battle, you probably have to win it on premise first and develop that name recognition and taste recognition. And then hopefully that can permeate into the off premise and people can get some scale and offer it at a decent price point. But the corners that are cut to make a cheaper lager make it very difficult to, to compete. Yeah. And then there's a certain level of commodification. Like, I don't think you can get as much variation with the distributed craft lager as you can with the distributed craft IPA, right? There's all sorts of things you can do with a craft IPA, theoretically, I guess you could with the lager too, but then it kind of becomes less about the easy drinking experience, right? There are know. cachet lager brands out there. I, uh, does anybody listen to this thing anyway? <laughs> no. Uh, Nobody. Yeah, I, I personally find it like the top of the line, like most sought after ones in the industry. I, uh, I've had some of them, not all of them. And I think they're very good, uh, but I also enjoy in equal measure ones that don't nearly have the fanfare. Uh, right. From some of our supplier partners and maybe it's just my uh, basic palette but i yeah i don't know how the end consumer is uh, feeling about all this but maybe that's the key maybe hype is an integral sure. portion of this industry that's here to stay sure. always yeah yeah uh, it does seem like for whatever re- reason ipas are more palatable in a can and in package and a like a craft pilsner it doesn't seem as appealing in a can but it does mm-hmm out of a keg. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And IPAs warm pretty well if you don't drink them right away. Yeah. 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 So, well, God, this has been fascinating. I'm uh, so glad we had you on, Eric. Uh, uh, very good stuff. Uh, I wish you well. It sounds like you guys are just killing it, and that's awesome. I like to see, I'm really gratified to see that there's kind of this upspring, springing up of uh, that third player in each market that can take care of these brands that aren't mass sold and that need extra care and education and selling. Uh, I'm in danger of making a speech, but the point of that narrative is that uh, uh, glad to see you guys are doing well. We'd love to have you back on BeerNet Radio. I hope at least some of your dreams came true. Yeah. And, uh, and uh, <laughs> all right, great. And uh, just want to uh, again plug really quick. We do have the Distributor Productivity Summit, a half day webinar on July 27th. Check beernet.com for tickets and more information. You want to talk about dreams coming true? Ugh, yeah. <laughs> if you attend that, I think you're going to have some dreams coming true. So we cover IT, we cover routing, we cover warehouse, we cover what else, Jen, did you say? Ecom, digital. Yeah. Ecom, digital, whatever you like. And, uh, you know, it's just a few hundred bucks. Get your tickets today. All right. Well, thanks, Eric. And we will see you guys down the river and we'll see you probably we're going to have a Wednesday warehouse and then we'll have another guest next week. So thanks, guys. And take care. Thanks so much for having me. Take care, guys.